Hi, my name is Rachel and today we're doing The Gloom Between Stars Part 2. If you have not watched Part 1, it is linked down below. I am not going to do a recap because I'm not doing any more intro than that. It, part 1 is down below. If you haven't watched it, please do and then you can come back. Or if you just like to be chaotic, you can you can stay. That's fine too. I'm just going to jump in. Okay, but first I want to start by addressing a comment that I got. This comment left me in absolute tears. I will read it now for you. <clears throat> Did I hear right? Did she call the water creature Naki or was it Naki? Because if she did call it Naki, that's so fucking funny. Naki is the Finnish version of the Scandinavian Naken, which comes from the Germanic mythology and is Nixie in English. Why did she use the Finnish name when there's no other Finnish elements and there's the English word too? If I heard it right, that is, I might not have. You did. But if she used it without the, I don't know what that's called, the, with the, yep, as Naki, it's so funny to me because Naki means sausage in Finnish. Um, so this is referring to the fact that the uh, water creatures in the uh, earlier part of this book that came out and stole people from their beds were called Naki. So I checked and yes this is the spelling that was used which means the scene in part one where the water creatures came out and stole people from their beds uh, which was linked to the country of Soulgrave doing terrorist acts. Those water creatures were actually hot dogs. Yes. Okay so with that out of the way <laughs> I have so many questions. So at this point, I'm asking a bazillion questions. I'm serious. What is Moiray's plan long term? She's a human, right? So isn't she going to die? Who will she leave the country to? Because the uh, illusion of her uh, prince grandson is obviously going to leave when she dies, right? So like, what's the term? What's the long term plan? Why wouldn't we like take the opportunity to have her like try to get in contact with Knox if she didn't know about her um, and like try to like groom her into being like the leader that Moiray wants, you know? Couldn't they send in Nox or someone claiming to be Nox? Why aren't they considered considering tricking Moiray? Like that seems like a good option. Why aren't they considering alerting other countries like uh, Tarkani and the Ital Isles? Uh, why aren't they contacting the Reavers about Moiray considering that the Reavers are all about peace on the continent and Moiray's about to do some like non-peaceful shit like invading? Isn't that kind of uh, what Amaris's whole mission was in book one was that Moiray was doing some fuck shit and she needed to go talk to her. Considering that Amaris was put in a dungeon by Moire and almost killed by a dragon, why aren't the Reavers doing something about that? Like, does Samael just not care? Isn't that kind of antithetical to, like, peace on the continent? Anyway, uh, why aren't they consulting with the university for help? Like, possible assistance or even just ideas? If there are those, like, water hot dog creatures... <laughs> Nope. Why aren't we considering like what other creatures there could be? Like if Soulgrave gets creatures on their side, like why can't we get creatures on our side? What other creatures exist? And is it possible for us to use them as weapons? Why aren't they trying to rebuild their army? Why aren't in like a, a, a way that actually counts for anything? Why aren't they trying to make amends for the fact that they're housing the person who killed their army? How has that affected the country? How did the, how did Ceres' role affect the country? There's no reason to not answer these questions in war room meetings, like in a way that is satisfactory authors please get yourself beta readers who ask these questions and help you like make better drafts of your books so that you don't leave plot holes in them to the point where it looks like fucking swiss cheese okay moving on so ash is now tanith's nanny uh leave me be mutt she calls him she also calls him a beast so did i mention that they're gonna fall in love Aww. uh amara says that ash has to be the adult and he says no she has to get over her magical bigotry and amara is like no you need to be kind and also be the bigger person and also uh, spend your time together sparring. And he's like, is that a good idea? No, it's not a good idea. Nothing about this is a good idea. Then Amaris goes drinking with Yaslin, you know, that chick who is responsible for the fact that her dad's dead. Uh, and she realizes she's never had a woman for a friend, it says. What were you and Knox then as kids? Okay. Further, it is quite shocking to me again that she is friends with Yaslin and especially as that relationship has been cultivated when we never went through her processing the grief of losing the literal only father she ever had. Gadriel says, hey, that shockwave power that you have, by the way, we need to work on it so that you can use it. But it only comes out at certain times when she cannot control it. So he goes to her room the next day after she's been drinking with Yaslin and proceeds to throw her off her balcony without her consent as training, but it's not working. So he keeps trying repeatedly. Um, and she says to him, I seem to recall a method that worked quite well last time, which is referring to him choking her. 
A muscle in his jaw ticked with interest. Go on. She blushed again and abandoned him where he stood near the tower. Amaris couldn't believe she'd been so bold as to attempt flirting after he'd tried no fewer than seven times to murder her. Girl, same. Same. Uh, not long after this, they are alone and it's getting spicy and he starts to choke her. And it says, adrenaline, oxytocin, and fear clouded her in a drunken cocktail. Adrenaline and oxytocin. Cool, 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 cool. Apparently the mixture of like spicy time and fear is what makes her power come out. She stood at the epicenter of a sonic boom as the room erupted. Sonic boom? Is that an anachronism? Mm, I'll let it slide. And uh, so then after she makes a sonic boom, which is not a euphemism for an orgasm, unlike 10,000 angels and promotions and rank uh, from, you know, last video. Anyway, it says she kissed him and it, it says she tasted like, he tasted like black cherry and power, which sounds suspiciously like like a car air freshener that every fuckboy I went to high school with would have in his car. Then he says of the fact that him choking her brings out her shockwave power. It was a theory at best, wishful thinking maybe, when I gave it a shot, but you seem to have merged survival instincts with arousal. Arousal. Truly, it's my best case scenario. Okay, I bet it is, fuckboy. I bet it is. And then not long after this, they have a conversation where they're like, they like, I, I like like you. Just kidding. They're saying they're interested in more. More than what? Choking, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, she tries to seduce him and he's like, nah. Why? Because apparently we're saving P and V sex uh, until book four. Because it's apparently it's like that important. We wouldn't want to like not have Amaris's virginity be like the shining star at the end of this book series. It says she'd never experienced the fullness of sex, though they had gone up to the press before. The fullness of sex? P and V isn't the end-all be-all of sex. The fullness of sex. They were playing with fire, or perhaps more actively, what more accurately, playing with sonic booms. Okay. So for the rest of the book, they work outside the castle um, doing this mix of like fighting slash sexy time slash choking in order to force her power out because she's the savior who's going to use it on Moira. Amaris and Nox see each other in a dream and it says, did you call this a dream? Then it is a good dream. And I'm like, hold on. I've heard this literal exact line before. This is a weird. They're all in the war room and Tanith is there because the quickest way to deprogram a cult member who is, uh, you know, responsible for war crimes is to allow them near enemy secrets. How's it going between the two of you? And Knox directed her question at Ash. Ash sighed. <sighs> About as well as one might expect. This is here to remind us that they're the enemies to lovers trope, even though he uh, has no magic and for that reason she calls him a beast and a mutt. Okay. Hey, remember in the last book where they were like making ideas about how to deal with the fact that Moira has that perception curse that causes everybody in Roscott to, once they cross the border into white people land Fairhold, um, to look like a demon. Yeah. Uh, their idea is to make rings that everybody wears. Zekai puts his on and it says um, that his, unlike Amaris's, is the masculine equivalent being a thicker metallic band with the stone set firmly within. Why we gotta make these war rings masculine and feminine? Why we gotta do that? This is not accessorizing. It's supposed to keep you alive. Everyone in the room, save for Tanith, gets one. So everybody gets a friendship bracelet except for Tanith. So what happens when you're a war criminal, they'll feed you and house you and give you all the books you want and be nice to you and consider you a friend, but they draw the line at giving you a friendship ring. So Knox tried to, tries to include her by asking, if you were at a meeting with your advisors, what would be something you would deem important in this conversation? And Tanith's like, I guess we'd reiterate objectives and what's being done to achieve them. Knox made an appreciative noise. I don't know what that means. Is that like, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm really snarky today. That's excellent, Tanith. What do you mean that's excellent? You can come up with that on your own? Why are you patronizing her? That's so weird. Good job, Tanith. Like, come on now. They go on to talk about what's being done, but none of it answers any of the logical questions I have about what's going on here. Other than the attack on Yelijin, we haven't seen any evidence of the soul grave faith south of the Straits. How is that possible? Literally, how is that possible? Considering soul grave faith are easily identifiable and like nobody has seen them in in fucking forever aren't they like you know kind of hard to miss when they don't look like the rest of the white folks in Fairhold anybody from Roscott comes over the border and they're like oh my god and they get super racist about it but like soul grave people are just running around how how incompetent is your spy network good grief Amaris Tanith Ash and Malik go to talk to two reavers who don't live at Um Reeve but they live together oh they were roommates doing other shit Graham and Aaliyah and Aaliyah is Ash's biological father. He's got daddy issues. 
that's a random theme that gets pulled into this book. So they say that Tanith is harmless, right? And Amaris thinks to herself how, uh, not exactly, Tanith was perhaps the single most dangerous fae on the continent. Cite your source. When did we establish that? This is like when Michael Scott said, I declare bankruptcy! You have to actually like do the work to do that. So Alil shows up and he says, and he's, he's a grump apparently, which we don't know anything about him. This is the first time he's showing up in this series. In your limited time in Roscott, he said each word colder than the one before. It seems you've managed to gain more exclusive access and knowledge to Soulgrave than I have in my more than 10 years north of the border. Are you here to hand her over to us? Okay. And it says Amaris's cortisol spiked as alarm ticked through her. She moved an arm to block Tanith, but she saw that Ash was already repositioning his body to shield her. Wow, all it took to bond them was his daddy issues. Amazing, amazing. I can't say that my daddy issues would ever make me bond with a war criminal, but mm, you know, I'm built different. Elil says, I need the name of your commander. Tanith looks at Ash before responding, we have no commander. And they explain, she belongs to a religious movement. This is not an issue of government or military. You won't get anywhere while threatening her. So why don't we sit down and civilly discuss, discuss our options? And it says, anger pumped through the room with a steady pulse. I have no fucking clue why though. I don't know why this is an issue other than, than to manufacture a problem where there has not been established to previously have been a problem. I have no idea why Elil is like going rogue, why this can't be worked out with a simple conversation, why they don't defer to like the rest of the Reavers as like on, on like, a, like a council basis like they did when Amaris was was wanting to be admitted into the Reavers. So Elil asks, is there a leading member of your church? And she refuses to answer. It says Tanith would sooner die than betray the beliefs that had sent her across the Arctic wastelands. So he's mad it, that they brought her there if not to say what she knows, which actually honestly is a fucking fair point, especially because she's a literal fucking war criminal. But again, this could be dealt with a simple conversation. And I just want to point out the extremely pertinent detail that Amaris knows the answer to the question he just asked. As I talked about in part one, like one of the first conversations she has, has with Tanith, Tanith answers this question and says that they have a speaker who is the goddess, is the living embodiment of the goddess. Why would Amaris not just offer that and say, I have the answer you're looking for. I can tell you what she told me. I don't think she's going to talk, but I'll tell you what I know. Simple conversation. Why are we not doing that? Why did Amaris not say anything? It's it's not for any reason that exists, like, it, it's, to be understood within the text. It's literally like the author just fucking forgot. Like, Amaris could simply say, let's talk about it. I'll speak on her behalf. Like, why aren't they compromising? Why aren't they trying to defuse the situation? Or like, at least lie. Make something up to get out of there. Ash says, it was good to see you, father, but it was a mistake to come as a group. Wait, why did you come as a group? group then. Was that an option? Why not? If you knew that Elil was like kind of kind of iffy, why not just go talk to him first yourself and then bring Tana? Why not just have Amaris and Malik go? There's really no logical reason at all. It was all just so that we could have this tense scene happen. So Elil blocks them from leaving, implies he'll torture Tana to get answers for from her, and Ash says, I will speak to Tana about the hierarchy of her religious organization. I will return with my findings. Again, bro, Amaris is standing right there. Why is she not saying what she knows. She knows what the hierarchy is. She knows about the speaker. Offer to tell him in exchange for Tanith and Ash leaving unscathed. Hello? So the reaver that lives with Elil, Grem, they were roommates, is on their side and it says the whites of Grem's eyes matched his soundless cry as he jumped to prevent the inevitable. The whites of Grem's eyes matched his soundless cry. It. So Elil fights with him with his shadow magic, which he has because he's a southern fae, which is why Ash is half fae. Ash doesn't have any magic though, which is why Tanith initially calls him a dog. Anyway, they get away and they go back to the Roscott capital and it says, I feel like all the evidence that he's been single-mindedly obsessed with this mission has been right in front of us. I don't know what I was thinking bringing Tanith there. Me fucking either. But also, I what evidence that he has been single-mindedly obsessed? When? That, that's never been established. Knocks 
told you to bring her, says Amaris to Ash. Even if she hadn't told me to, I would have brought her. It made sense. We've learned so much from her in the war room. When? What did you learn? I don't know about this. What are you talking about? And in the in the narration, it says he hadn't been a husband, nor had he been a father. Now Eliel was hardly even a person. He'd been, become as consumed with his desire to eliminate the threat of Soulgrave as Ceres had been with his desire to reunite with his child. So that's an interesting way to put it, considering that both of those people are dead by the end of this series. <laughs> but yet Tanith is alive. <laughs> Anybody who is not uh, capable of having like a new cultivated romance is going to get killed off because that's not sexy. Ceres is just as bad as Elil. Elil is just as bad as Ceres. But Tanith is not as bad as either of those people. Tanith who murdered a bunch of people recently. Okay. Sure. Uh, instead of, you know, re recognizing this obvious fact, Knox actually says sorry to Tanith for sending her there and says, I don't want you to feel unsafe, which is wild considering that she killed uh, a bunch of fucking people that are Knox's people that she's the queen of. And Knox is like, just fine, I guess with this. Anyway, it says her sharpened canines, talking about Tanith, looked capable of drawing blood like the vampires of lore. When the fuck did we get vampires? She's like, I don't want you to feel unsafe. And Tanith's like, I don't. Well, obviously, y'all allowed her in the war room. She has her own room. She gets whatever book she wants. She gets fed. She never got tortured. You take her on excursions. She's having a fucking vacation. Of course she's not scared. You've demanded zero information out of her despite her murdering the majority of your army because she's hot. It's fine. Somehow them defending her has made her like them a little bit and not think of them as dogs so much now. Cool. So Nox says, hey, let's like go out on the town. And Tanis is like, I suppose we could and Ash could come too. Cool. Can't forget that we're making a romance out of the religious bigot who refers to people of a certain race as dogs and one of those people who she referred to as a dog. Love that. Awesome. So Malik has to go talk to the Reavers about the shit that happened with Elil and why they don't, first of all, why they didn't just go talk to them in the first place about all this is beyond me and why they don't ask uh, the Reavers for fucking help considering that Moiray literally tried to kill Amaris two books ago. One of the Reavers is beyond me. I don't fucking get it. They're supposed to be about peace, but they're not doing anything in this time of no peace. Help me understand. Anyways, before he goes, him and Knox, who again have a romance, uh, Knox says to him, the watch, it's in my top drawer. Take it so you can always find your way back. Now, in the video I did on the sun in its shade, I noted that I actually like the idea of the like the different magical um, artifacts that, that is are written into here. A candle that never goes out, a pen that writes directly to its twin. So like one person has one pen, the other person has the other pen. It's a little Harry Potter for me, but mm, it's different enough that it's it's not a problem. I like the idea and I really liked the idea of a pocket watch that always point you points you towards where you want to go until somebody pointed out that that's literally just Jack Sparrow's compass and then a million other people pointed it out in my comments making me realize that that thing that I like is not even an original thing. It's just something I liked from other media. Again, cool. Great. Awesome. Love it. Also, the candle has been fucking useless at this point and we're three books in so I'm thinking that we're not going to get any use out of that. Uh, they're all in the dining room like fucking college students in a fucking cafeteria and making jokes about how Knox doesn't wake up until noon, which if I was queen, I wouldn't wake up until noon either, but yeah. It says that Gadriel sparkled with amusement as he slid another hot cup, hot, hot, hot cup of, as he slid another hot cup of tea towards Yaslin. So eyes can sparkle with amusement, but saying Gadriel sparkled with amusement just makes me think of this. This is what I am. This is the skin of a killer, Bill. Cool, cool, cool. Okay. Then Knox and Yaslin go shopping because somehow despite us being told that Ceres' rule was terrible for the kingdom and despite the fact that their entire army was murdered um, by the person that they're keeping as a guest in their castle, um, the common folks are fine. Yaslin led her to a few of the jewelry shops a few. Tailors, leathersmiths, bakeries, antique shops, and even a mystical shop filled with spelled objects. And she's like, there's just a shop full of spelled objects? And Yaslin says, anything truly wicked or dangerous is confiscated, but for the right price, pretty much anything can be bought. Confiscated by whom? If y'all are in charge, do you have them? And why aren't you thinking of ways to use them considering you are literally at war? All that time in the war room thinking, how could we be nicer to the war criminal that we're housing? Y'all aren't thinking, what weapons do we literally have in our arsenal? No, no, no sense. No sense here. Still looking, not finding it. Maybe I need that fucking Jack Sparrow compass to point me to it. The shopkeeper gives Knox a ribbon that makes her entire body unable 
able to be stabbed. So my question is, how are these made and why would you not be making a shit ton more? No answer for that question. Cool. And he says, what if in exchange for the ribbon, you promise to be a kind and fair queen? Does that sound like a deal? What would sound like a deal would be answers. Like, does he really not know anybody who was affected by the fact that the entire army has been murdered? Hello? Now we get to chapter 30 and this is where the writing really just takes a dive into the waters of like what the fuck. Ash wakes up in the night while everybody else is asleep, okay? It said he only heard silence and winter. Let's unpack that. If you hear something and you hear things, it means that you don't hear silence. If you hear silence, it means you don't hear things. So first of all, how do you hear winter? How do you just hear winter? This should be expand upon. It's not. If you hear winter, you're going to have to explain what that means. Does that mean you hear uh, the wind cutting through the trees? Does that mean that you hear the crunch of snow? Um, but if you hear those things, then you can't also hear silence at the same time. So which is it? And also what the fuck is hearing winter? Where was the editor? He wasn't sure why, but he couldn't let himself go back to bed. Instead, a small adrenaline motivated him to slide out from under his covers, stand, and light a small handheld lantern. I have so many questions. Was it really necessary for to say small handheld lantern? Like presumably you can just handhold it. Okay. But my biggest question is what the fuck is a small adrenaline? I got it made. Is that like a five hour energy shot? What the fuck does that mean? Why did you write it that way? The chilly night soon had Ash wishing he had put on a shirt and slippers. Of course he didn't put on a shirt. Of course he didn't. But the tingle of urgency had rushed him from his room in the pants he'd slept in. Tingle of urgency, is that like that really awful feeling you get when you have a UTI? So he goes to Tanith's room, the door is locked, he shouts, Gadriel opens it because one of Gadriel's powers beyond the ability to have his neck broken and not die is to just open any lock. It says he hears like muffled sounds of Tanith and it says Tanith must be gagged somewhere in the shadow because the room is full of shadow. So obviously Ilil is there, right? Why didn't Ilil just grab her? her and leave. He had time to gag her? What? Ash notices the windows busted open and it said this was how the man had entered and it was undoubtedly how he planned to leave. If hooks were engraved with dampening spells, Ilil's infiltrating tools may have crashed through the glass soundlessly. And I'm like, wait, we have engraving magic now? What are the limits of that? Why aren't we using engraving magic to invade Moire before she invades us? What the fuck are we doing here? And if the Reavers have that capability, why didn't we ask them for some of that shit. Okay. Anyway, Elil and Gadriel and Ash are fighting. It says about Ash that his, though his equilibrium was bobbing uncomfortably, he forced his eyes wide open. His equilibrium was bobbing. In the last book, it said that the equilibrium of somebody was floating. That's such a weird fucking way to use the word equilibrium. Something about that is just incorrect. Just say he had fucking vertigo that incapacitated him. It's not, just because equilibrium is a cool word does not make sense in that sentence. Like it, it sound just because it sounds pretty does not mean that it's not nonsense. It's just pretty nonsense. Okay, they fight and Ash, who up to this point has no fey power because he's only half fey, you're not supposed to have any fey powers, suddenly comes into his power. And of course, whenever we have like a shadow magic user, we have to have like the opposite of that, which is the light magic user. So like fourth wing, the entire premise of the Grisha trilogy, it's it's always present, right? And like Tanith also has light in lightning. So, you know, they're, they're, they're matchy matchy. Okay, moving on. Uh, he's a light person and his dad's a shadow person. It says, Ash screamed into the night, a piercing white light erupted from his mouth, his fingers, his eyes, his entire being seemed to explode in sunlight. Oh, it's like that. It's like that scene from Beauty and the Beast. So driving out his dad's shadows. And he says to his dad, who they now have in custody, I've known for a long time that your mission was more important than your family. I knew it when my mother died. I knew it when you failed to send letters or an encouraging word. I couldn't have known you'd even try to murder your own son. Yeah, I couldn't have known that either because it wasn't established. And uh, <laughs> his dad says, what importance is blood against a calling? You know, I feel like, I feel like Tanith would say something like that. And like when his dad says it, he's a bad guy. But when Tanith 
says it, she's hot, so it doesn't matter. What does one life matter against the lives of the continent? Is your soul grave phase life worth more than the countless who remain vulnerable because you're too weak to do what needs to be done? And Ash shakes his head and says, maybe not, but it's sure worth as a hell, sure as hell worth more than yours. We should have established this issue between the two of them and Elil's uh, obsession with soul grave two books ago. There was no reason not to. They lock up Elil in the dungeon. Meanwhile, Tanith, who actually murdered people, gets pitied. Her shoulders shook as fears crashed over her, audible tears coming from the strong stoic fae who wore red night dresses even to sleep. Oh yeah, did I mention that Tanith only wears red? That'll be uh, pertinent in a moment. And she, being that her redemption is really just falling in love with a half fae who um, she only uh, now considers to be worthy of speaking to and previously had called a dog and a beast. Um, her redemption is just her falling in love with him. Great. That's awesome. No accountability. So she wants to stay with Ash and it says Tanith lifted her tear soaked face to ask what Ash can I stay with you? He blinked his surprise but nodded quickly. Yes of course. Yes because we should forgive the war criminal but not your dad who didn't kill anybody. Okay. He'd chosen Tanith the moment he'd moved his body between hers and his father's in the townhouse. He'd been willing to die for her earlier that very night and she knew it. Their shift had occurred with the glacial slowness responsible for transformation. What? Since when? And then I guess they have sex? I don't know. It's not on page. She technically is still a prisoner because she has like cuffs on that dampen her powers, but she's also still a war criminal and a murderer. So just want to point that out. They have a meeting and Knox says, I shit you not, how much more medieval is Fairhold than Roscott? Okay. Despite being in these meetings, they are not asking any of the questions that I, the reader, feel are logical to ask. <laughs> they decide, you know what, it's time to have some fun. We've been working so hard. I just feel like we deserve a break. So what do they do for fun? Is it A, go to a bar, B, get some sushi, C, go see a play, or D, act out that scene from Swan Princess where Prince Derek and his friends uh, shoot each other with chalk arrows. If you guessed C, you're wrong. It's actually fucking D. Ready, set, go! The arrows in their quivers, it says, were not tipped with any sort of metal or stone. Each arrow had a thick blunt powder filled pouch of thin tissue at its tip stuffed with a vibrant color. Each of them had been assigned a hue. So just Ash, Malik, I think Tana too? Maybe? I don't remember. Why not give the war criminal uh, a, a chance to have some fun? Knox, Amaris, Gadriel, Yaslin, they're all just yucking it up doing that scene from Swan Princess. They can't use real bows, certainly in Knox's case, because she doesn't know how. Um, she's more adept with her axe, as we've established, her axe name, Chandra. Gadriel gives her a bow, and it says, it's a child's bow. They're harmless by design. It's little more than a toy. You can't hit your target with violence. And it automatically, like, hits, it, something about it was, like, magical. And for some reason, it was able to be applied, this magic, to this child's bow, but not to actual weapons. And she asks about this. What would keep an enemy from having all of their archers possess bows like this? Knox asks, which is a reasonable question. Gadriel sighed, because like I said, it's a toy. Knox says, but couldn't manufacturers, and he cuts her off saying, if they could, I suspect we'd all have them. Manufacturing isn't something I have a knack for, but I know it's taxing, tedious, and expensive. Harmless things like toys and knickknacks are usually some of the few things that get made successfully. Other things, well, it's hit or miss. You'll have to ask your tutor. <laughs> laziest attempt of not answering a pert pertinent question. You might as well have just not put it on the page. Like, oh, you'll have to ask your tutor. <laughs> okay, well who the fuck do I ask? The reader. Because I don't have a tutor. And boy am I fucking confused. So they're running around doing the scene from Swan Princess, as I established, and it says they were a kaleidoscope of battle and amusement. Again, kaleidoscope is not just a mishmash of things and also... So they're uh, running around. Then they go to the bar. And if you guessed A, they go to a bar. You're not technically wrong. They do. Uh, just after they do the Swan Princess scene. And they're talking about threesomes. And Tanith um, says that she's done that. And like the Reavers are like appalled that she's had a threesome. And they're like shocked because you know she's religious. And she says, are you three not also the sword arms of the All Mother? Celibacy isn't expected of any of you, is it? I don't see what battle readiness and magical servitude have to do with sexuality. We're not bishops or priestesses wed to the all-mother. 
you all know so little of the church. I find it interesting that we use the word church instead of faith, first of all. And second of all, yeah, can we talk about that? The fact that they know so little about the only religion in this world? No? We're not going to? Okay. Instead of explaining the discrepancies against amongst this exact same church they're all a part of, Knox is like, wow, I'm so glad that I let this murderer into our ranks and coddled her without ever asking her to apologize for murdering my own people and my army. Knox wasn't sure that Tanith had shown any distance from her radical religion or repentance for her war crimes. Literally called it war crimes in the text. But with every day that passed, it felt more and more that Tanith no longer considered them enemies. Aww. They he may even cautiously have begun to consider her a friend. Oh, I'd love for Knox, the literal fucking queen, to tell that last part to the families of those that Tanith murdered that Knox is the queen of. I know I'm in charge and I, I know that I'm housing and feeding and coddling and apologizing for a literal war criminal, but that war criminal is my friend. This is ridiculous. This makes no fucking sense. It's just beating the audience over the head with, you're supposed to like Tanith. It doesn't matter if it doesn't make sense. She's hot and has a romance with another hot person. So that's fine. Everything's fine if you're sexy. Later they say of Tanith, I had thought Elil might really drive her away from any progress we'd made with her. Who knew Ash's crazy father was our missing puzzle piece? First of all, I resent the use of the word crazy here for, you know, ableist implications, certainly, but also um, the fact that he's right. She is a dangerous war criminal and y'all are coddling her and he was just at trying to ask pertinent questions. Like, I don't agree with torturing her, certainly, but I can understand why he might not like her. And I don't understand why y'all do, other than the fact that this was written to tell us that we have to like her because she's hot. Okay. Um, all right. That's fine. Uh, my biggest question at this point is, are you fucking serious? The next chapter, they're in another useless war room meeting. Knox fought the hot coals of emotion that threatened her diplomacy. That description, hot coals of emotion, is about as serious as oh, I'm in a glass case of emotion! Zakai mentions intel that Queen Moire has replaced her captain of the guard, the guy in the first book that Knox uh, slowly castrated in you know, book one, with two people. There are two in his stead, a man and a woman who've been promoted to captain. We don't have names, but they're referred to as the hand and the hammer, which honestly, at this point, at this point, sounded pretty cool. However, we are at 75% through this book at this point that I'm reading this. How are we just getting this info now? How incompetent of a spy master are you? And unfortunately, when we meet them, not only is it brief to the point of pointlessness, it's also wildly fucking ableist. Knox and Malik fool around because of of course they do, but they can't have P and V sex naturally because um, in that world, that's the end all be all. So assumedly we're saving that for book four because she's a succubus and he's a man. They also cannot have P and V sex without it being a problem. Apparently it's fine if she has sex with a woman. With what? With a woman. I don't know. Randomly, at least to me, they decide that it's time to cross the border back into Fairhold. We're almost done. Isn't that exciting? Oh wait, no we're not. Oh my god, we have four pages of notes left. Fuck. Okay. All right, we're almost, we're, we're getting there. We're, mm, we're over, we're over halfway done. They decided that it's time to cross the border back into Fairhold and take out Moire. Oh look, some plot. <laughs> it only took until 80% and a swan princess scene to get us here, but okay. So they're leaving and Nox and Amaris finally decide to make up. Remember how they were in a useless fight? Uh, they're mad at each other over some contrived bullshit so that the ultimate reunion can once again be put off. I'm here to remind ya. Uh, so she says, you are going to come back to me. Amaris's care Careful, emotionless facade crack. Her throat bobbed, and for the barest of moments, Knox recognized the person she'd known for so many years. And Amara says, and once I break the curse, basically like, okay, then what happens to us then? Knox wrapped her arms around Amara's and pulled her in tightly, crushing her as she said, you don't need to break the curse for me to know what we have is real. I'm a goddess damn fool. I'm so, so sorry for ever doubting it, for doubting us. I doubt, I don't know if you'll forgive me. Knox has decided that she loves Amara's even if it's, you know, fate and it was just the goddess metal so, you know, that <laughs> that was a useless plot point. Knox, Ash, and Tanith, obviously because Tanith wouldn't go anywhere without her, her main man who she called a dog just a few chapters ago. Knox, Ash, Tanith, and Zekai stay behind in Roscott 
in the castle where Nox is queen. Yeah? Zakai, the spy master, doesn't go with them to, f to Fairhold. Okay. He stays. Amaris, Gadriel, Malik, and Yaslin all go to cross the border back into Fairhold. They first go to Farley, the orphanage where Amaris and Nox grew up, and they find the Grey Matron, and they need to test if their shit that they created to, like, uh, stop the, the, the curse from happening, where it turns them, like, it, it, projects an illusion to make them look like a scary creepy monster thing. They need to test out that it worked. And the, at first they think it doesn't because the gray matron looks at Gadriel and she's like, ew, gross, a demon. But then she confirms that she sees him as Faye, as a person, not as an, a Jimny, a Gimny, whatever. Meaning the curse is not working on them. The, the things that they created to, you know, help stop the curse are working. And so Amara says, just to be clear, you don't see an a Jimny, you're just racist. Hold on. <laughs> So her calling, so the Grey Matron calling the Roscott Fay demon and demonic is racist, but Amaris's pet name for Gadriel is demon. And that's fine. Woof. Fack and Roscott, they're having tea time with their favorite war criminal. And she says that her favorite color is blue, despite her having worn red this whole entire book, right? And Knox is like, then why do you wear red all day and night? Even your night dresses are red. They specifically got her red night dresses at her request. They got a war criminal. <sighs> specified clothing? Oh my god. Between bites of food that they're feeding her, the war criminal, uh, she said, it's my title. Everyone in the church wears the color of their station. They ask, what are the different colors and their significance? significances? Well, I guess my station is a bit like Ash's. He's told me that the Reavers are the sword arm of the All-Mother, so am I. Though the Reavers are self-governed and we most certainly are not. Red is for the battle-ready activists. The church recognizes us by our color and calls us Reds. Not everyone in Soulgrave is religious, you know. In fact, I'd say that it's part of what makes those of us in the church feel ever more closely knit. Dressing for our station helps us identify one another even when we're in territories and villages so we always know how to locate other believers. The bishops wear white and gold. They are generally the, re the readers and those who hold church services across Soulgrave. When we gather, a bishop will address a congregation of those of us in gray, red, green, and black, as well as the faithful across all territories who gather in their typical attire. What are green and black? They ask her. The greens are the monetary arm of the church. They handle taxation, tithing, donations, and charities. Our priestesses wear black. They are the closest to the All Mother and serve her most intimately. They do not live in or reside in the church meant for public ceremonies, but in the sacred temples. They are the highest in our organization except for the speaker. The church doesn't always require a speaker, but one is provided every few millennia, usually in times of great strife or change. The speaker is the All Mother made flesh to tell us her word. I just want to remind you again that Amaris already knows this information and didn't tell them. Zakai asks her, would Amaris be considered a speaker, and Tanith shook her head, looking almost offended. No, Amaris is an acorn from the tree. The tree, the speaker is the tree itself walking amongst us. One, we are at 85% through this book. Why would any of y'all not have asked her this shit sooner? Especially when she obviously requested red be given to her, red clothing be given to her. You didn't ask her why? How can you be this incompetent? Two, this is information Tanith could have just told Elil to get him off of her back. This is not a big deal. He was asking her about leaders. Why not just tell him about the speaker? Hello? And again, I just want to point out, again, Amaris already knew about the speaker at the beginning of the book. So at Knox, 85% of this book now says, well, I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm going to the library to study theology for the rest of the day if anyone needs me. What the fuck? Why would you not have thought to do that sooner? You didn't think to do that sooner? You are supposed to be this smart, calculating person who likes to make plans and make lists about everything. And you didn't think, maybe I need to learn more about this captive person that I'm keeping in my house who murdered a bunch of my people. You didn't think, okay, sure. Mm -hmm. In Ash's POV, it says, the similarities between how the faith had manifested had been surprising. Through time, distance, and isolation, certainly created chasms in its practice. He appreciated the implication that their church had a single figurehead. Again, how did Amar not tell her brother this information. She already knew since like way earlier in the book. It might be an important key in learning how to best stave the tide of monsters as battle-ready zealots in red continued to their blood-soaked travel across the continent, but he would leave the studying to others. So if she requested red clothes, wouldn't you assume, hey, maybe the others she came with are also, also all wearing red. Maybe we should be on the lookout for that. No? 
No? Okay. Sure. That's fine. Okay. Amaris majorly fucked them over by not telling them about the speaker thing. It says Knox had brought home nearly every record of soul grave theology she could find. What do you mean soul grave theology? And how do you have records on this? I thought that you guys didn't know anything about soul grave. And what does soul grave theology mean? The way that the same religion that y'all have has its own books about how it manifests particularly in soul grave? There's already books on that even though you guys said that you guys don't know much about soul grave. <laughs> what? And also, why are you just thinking of this now? What? You are 85% through this book. Uh, she was no longer alone in her pursuit of knowledge as a rather enthusiastic librarian had glued himself to her upon her arrival and piled her high with books. Why would you not have th thought to put a librarian on this on this sooner? Like, if you don't have time to do it yourself, fine. Why would you not think, let me, let me, let, let me get, like, the, the people who, who have the knowledge in on this. She vowed to fill her time cross-referencing religious practices and creating a map of similar similarities and differences. Yeah, why would you not have done this months ago? You've literally been sitting there for months eating pastries and, and playing Swan Princess games. What? She's talking and she says, growing up there had been a compulsive understanding that the All-Mother was the only de deity. She was the norm. Seeing cultures and pockets of people write of different encounters and various practices just made me examine the way I'd look at life. She chewed her lip. I don't think I'm interested in studying the old gods, at least not yet. There's too much I don't understand about the existing religion to expand. This is a fun way to remind Mind your readers that you haven't done any lore building for the religion you've created. <laughs> Okay. And then I almost forgot that we have a handwritten collection of letters between theologians that you might find interesting. It's something of an antiquity and pretty niche interest, but you're the queen. You could order the library burned if you wished. One, you just happen to have this at 85%. Okay, sure. She's like repulsed at the thought of anyone having the power to erase knowledge from the face of the earth. This actually would have been a really fun way to explain why we don't know much about the deviations in religion already. I actually wish that that had been a plot point. So she's looking at this collection of letters it says the historian wrote the mythos of the all mother had disseminated differently throughout time culture and kingdom I would like to know how but I've come to find a common thread running through all the texts much like a connective tissue or undercurrent dear friend they'll call me a madman but I don't believe the goddess to be more than a woman maybe a collection of women with greater power or abilities for creation than the others understand these suspicions may need to die with us my friend for they are blasphemy and the theologian responded tell no one okay so that's actually a cool idea but there was no fucking reason why we couldn't have had this <laughs> be in book fucking one and not 85% through book three. It would have actually made, it feels like just shoved in here at the last minute. It would have made an actually interesting plot that lent itself to the reader feeling more immersed and understanding of the world, un immersed in and understanding of the world, but I guess not. But what do you think it means? What if it's just a fae? What if there's a fae who can send messages through trees or fruit? What if there's a fae who, and Zach is like, what if? Will it alter the way you do or don't worship? Will it impact your life in any way? Will it dissuade the zealots if you prove to them that they worship an, omnipot an omnipotent fae? And what is a god if not omnipotence? Why are we hinting at good plot ideas at the end of book three in a four book series? What are we doing? This is actually when I started getting interested and it fell off the rails pretty quick, but it was there, which tells me that this author still has potential if she would just get some people to work with her that would challenge her and encourage patience. A good work is not written in nine days. All I can think of is, is what might have been is, is what this whole series might have been if it had had the time and the care and the people that it needed in order to create something truly remarkable. It says Zakari said this in a way that told her that although he wasn't trying to be dismissive, theology was not an area of interest for him. Yeah, but you're the spy master. Like, shouldn't information be important even if it's not an area of interest? <laughs> like, this might be pertinent to what's happening in Soulgrave, which as the spy master, you should probably, you should probably consider like a possible threat. This might help you like understand it might lead you down a path to understanding like what's going on with the other four people you're supposed to be looking for on the continent, but okay. Amara sneaks into a banquet held by Queen Moire and she notices, what? notices that the prince, uh, who's an illusion, there's no like seat set out for him. So no one is seeing like the il illusion prince that Queen Moire casts. Um, that is like the, the supposed to be like the, the the son of Daphne that nobody knows is is not alive um, and also like they don't know that he doesn't actually exist. <laughs> so um, whatever this was implying though about him not having a seat in the room uh, never got told to us in the book and it feels like unimportant because Moiré is dead by the end of this book. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, uh, Moire Toast saying, To the expansion of Fairhold as we reclaim what is rightfully ours. And Amaris realizes that Moire sent her forces and is invading, invading Roscott as she sits there in Fairhold while Nox is up north. And in Nox's POV, a literal, literal storm is coming. The impending blizzard had seemed so far away only moments ago. She hadn't realized how quickly the threat could move this far north. <laughs> yeah, uh, oh boy, it seems like that's an ongoing theme for you, isn't it? How did you not, uh, plan for an invasion that you know is probably gonna happen? It's been literally months. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't realize how quickly the threat could move this far north. No shit. <laughs> What did you think Moira was doing? You were sitting there eating fucking apple pastries and drinking hot chocolate, which God only knows how you got your hands on fucking chocolate when you live up in the fucking north and nowhere near where cocoa would grow, but okay. And you've been sleeping until noon and hanging out with a war criminal for months. This is so stupid. It says, it's an invasion. Obeid must have known we'd go south for their banquet and leave the castle undefended. It was a trap. How and why were these people written to be so fucking incompetent? That's a choice. Uh, it mentions that they have almost no troops after, you know, Tanith the war criminal murdered them all several months previously. Any hoozy. <laughs> Ash is talking to the war criminal though, and does he tell her, hey, you put us in kind of a bad spot? No, no, he does not. He tells her, we've got this. He promised. She looked back at him with wide frightened eyes. We? He hated that she'd questioned it even for a second. I'm not gonna let anything happen to you. Ash had been foolish. In his time in Gwydir, he'd been too comfortable, too relaxed. He had not done his due diligence on hiding places, on exits, on weak points and strongholds, and now for all he knew, he was about to pay for it with both their lives. You don't say. It's almost as if you all were written that way on purpose as a setup for an easy invasion because tactical warfare uh, is actually kind of hard to write. Yeah, and certainly takes more than nine days. So who's here from Obeid besides soldiers? Obviously the captains of the guard, the hand and the hammer, right? Who we just found out about like very, er, very soon ago. What? Yeah, it's about to get ableist as fuck. So trigger warning for that until, okay, trigger warning for that until this timestamp, okay? So Nox and Zakai are in the throne room and it says, perfume descended on the throne room, drowning out the other sentence. The scent triggered a memory of a glossy carriage, a silken lounge of red velvet of death. And of course the scent that she's smelling is vanilla. Oh my god, it's Millicent, who we haven't seen since book one, who was the brothel owner who wanted to buy Amaris but got Nox as a consolation prize, also bought Emily from the orphanage and uh, sold both of them to men and then uh, Nox had a sexual relationship with Emily and Emily was in love with her and then Millicent murdered Emily and then uh, Nox basically didn't think about Emily at all. If we recall, she specifically murdered Emily with her hand, which is described as like a a lizard-like gray hand, a hand of death, and Millicent became a villain because of, very important to note that, this disabled hand of hers, she killed her own mother with it, which caused her father to shun her, that Millicent. The Madame of the Selkie had risen to the ranks of the Queen's hand, it says. So when I heard the hand and the hammer, I thought that this was like a metaphorical thing. I thought we were talking about like the hand of the king uh, and the hammer as in like somebody who uses a lot of violence. I thought it was metaphorical. It's not, it's literal. Mill Millicent's villain name is simply named after her disability and the hammer is just a big dude that has a literal hammer. They are simply literally the hand and the hammer. Millicent no long longer wore the long black gloves that had been a staple of hers for years. Her gray fatal arm was now a proud threatening fixture. She raised her deathly hand and gave it a flick to gesture for the hammer to advance. If he was the brawn, she was the brain with an unforgiving bite. She was a brain with an unforgiving bite? Okay. Meanwhile, Ash and Tanith are like, well, we should probably free Aleel. And Aleel is, um, you know, as we previously stated in the dungeon for being reasonable. I mean, he was mean to Ash's war criminal girlfriend. Aleel, the castle, castle's under siege. And he says, from Soulgrave? They say, no, you narrow-minded bastard. Narrow-minded? <laughs> you are standing next to the war criminal responsible for Roscott not having an army. Why is Aleel the problem here? Oh, wait, I'm so sorry. Because Tanith is hot. So me. Ignore me. I just keep forgetting. Ilil says your unwillingness to do what needs to be done is why you'll never be great. Which is weird. I thought that he cared about safety of the continent. I thought that that was his singular focus, which is like what the problem was. But now it's like he's suddenly prioritizing greatness, which I don't really know what that means to him. This character was never really established. So this just feels like nonsense. It's wishy-washy. Anyways, the troops are invading and Ash feels like all hope is lost. He takes off Tanith's handcuffs and she electrocutes everyone in the 
room, the Fairhold army and Ash's dad, but does not kill herself and Ash. It says, the silver sounds of death and horror and power filled the room, and then it was gone. How does death and horror and power sound silver? How do any one of those things sound silver? Okay. In the end, she gives him the cuffs back to put back on her, like a good little war criminal who just, you know, murdered his father and a bunch of other people. Tanith's exposure to this life and those in it had popped a hole in her worldview, draining the thoughts, the notions, and the anger she'd felt until the hate that had been forced upon her, forced? had dissipated and she was able to write her own story. She was not evil. She was not his father. His father was evil for thinking a war criminal was a danger? Okay, sure. All right, that makes no sense. Knox has this verbal back and forth with Millicent after she cuts off Millicent's hand. Trigger warning again for ableism until this timestamp. The witch's gray hand twitch, twitched like a spider's dismembered limb, phantom spasm still encouraging it to flex and the magic that had possessed her given her strength and fueled her wickedness for so many years ebbed out uselessly beside her. Knox could almost see the motion in Millicent's face as if she were trying to force the phantom limb to do her bidding. The woman's eyes darted in all directions like a mouse in a trap setting, settling on nothing. The, ma the madame's lips pulled back in a snarl. How can you think you're better than me in any way, whore? After all you've done? After what you've become? Do you know what I've suffered? Do you know how my mother died? How my father abandoned me? How I was sent off unloved, shown down and discarded. Shown down? Shown down? I copy pasted this. What does shown down mean? Oh well. Knox rolled her eyes. She took her foot from Millicent's chest, sighing as she plucked Chandra from its place on the ground. Hey, shh, shh. Listen very carefully to what I'm about to say to you because I won't allow you to die with any misconceptions between us. We've all had horrible childhood childhoods, Millicent. Who among us couldn't blame the world for how it made us grow cold? You've had all the time in the goddess's lighted kingdom to heal. You are no victim. Victim. and then she um, kills Millicent with the axe. Cool. You are no victim, she said, but Tanith is, right? Tanith had that worldview forced upon her. She didn't choose to kill all those people. Please. There was no reason to write a um, disabled hand that fueled her wickedness. It could have just been death magic. We didn't need to play into harmful stereotypes. This, <laughs> this, this like, uh, this just proves that it was indeed written to be the cause of her being evil, which is the opposite of how to write disability. It's not about just like having a disabled villain. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying it's about the disability being the cause of the quote wickedness. That's the problem. This needed a sensitivity reader. All right, we're in the home stretch. Oh my god, I got two more paragraphs. <sighs> All right, let me tell you about a part I actually really liked. I know, you're as shocked as I am. In walks into the banquet in Fairhold, where Amaris is. She is in disguise, in the throne room. In walks a ghoul, which is a zombie, essentially. And it's the zombie body of the captain of the guard that knocks castrated in book one. So these zombies attack, they fill the room, and the guards won't, well, can't fight back because Amaris, when she was walking into the castle, spoke to each guard individually and used her persuasion power. This is actually really cool, so I like it. Before she got to the throne room, one by one, telling the guard to not fight back because she was going to, like, attack Moire. But she didn't kill her in time before the ghouls attack. I thought all of this one scene was just really good. I didn't see it coming. I love when good plans backfire. I love surprise armies of the dead coming in to save the day, a la, you know, Lord of the Rings, Return of the King. Except the zombies are not saving the day. They're attacking everybody. Amaris, um, the, and we don't know who sent the zombies in. Like, we end the book not knowing. Amaris realizes that Queen Moire's crown is armor protecting her body, um, just like Nox's ribbon, and she needs to get the crown off her head to kill her. And Moire says, you can't touch me, witch. Wait a minute. Why is she calling Amaris a witch? Are we ever going to have a concrete understanding of what a or who a witch is in this world? Because we've gone back and forth. It's so wishy-washy. I don't even, I'm, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't fucking know. So for her to call her that, it makes no sense because earlier somebody else said that Moire is a witch. I, I, 
I don't understand. I don't get it. She gets Moiré's crown off and Amara says, I owe Daphne thanks. Amara shouted over the groan of the dead, voice stretched thin with pain. So they're like in the middle of a bunch of ghouls. And she says, "I she's the reason I exist. I was born to kill you. So she does successfully kill Moiré, but then the ghouls tear up Amaris too because they weren't, they, they weren't on either of their sides. Again, we don't know who or what sent them. I was, I, I thought that it would be cool if like Gadriel had figured out a way to like send in a bunch of ghouls. Like that would have been really cool. I don't know. I just feel like this is sort of a waste. So in the end, she almost dies, but um, she sees Nox in like a dream state again because Nox can dream walk and Nox tells her like, you, you have to come back to me. Don't die. So in the end, Amaris is like in bad shape, but still alive. We don't know who sent the ghouls. Uh, if I had to guess, maybe it's Soulgrave. I don't know. Assumedly, they are the like the big final big bad of the series, which I don't like because it feels like something that would have had better payoff if we had been sowing seeds of like regarding since book one. So like differences in religion, theories of these theologists way sooner. Like there's no reason we couldn't have cut out a ton of fucking filler and stupid nonsense and made that an actual plot point. There was so much filler. These books have so many pages and nothing happened. Nothing of value really happens. Everything of value is like a drop, like a, like a, a like an amoeba in a drop in a bucket. Is that how amoebas work? Like it's, it's nothing in comparison to the, the sheer like density of this. Like it's nothing. And that sucks. And like Moira is dead now and I don't understand her as a villain. I don't get it. I, so she was just racist. Like that was the whole thing. Like why did she do all this? What was her plan? Like what was, what was her end game? Like how was she gonna, she doesn't have an heir. How would she have continued her rule? How was she gonna stay alive? Like I, I don't understand her at all. I thought that we were going to have like, I thought we were gonna have a stupid villain speech, but I thought we were gonna at least get an explanation, but she's just dead. She can't even speak for herself. So I don't, I don't understand. She's just dead. The big bad, we barely ever saw her. We saw her for like two seconds in book one. And then we see her for, uh, like a, a chapter or so in this book. She was the big bad and she's now dead. What? This is so, this is so stupid. Uh, predictions for the next book. There's gonna be P and V sex for Nox and Malik. There's gonna be P and V sex for Gadriel and Amaris where he chokes her and there's gonna be sex for Nox and Amaris and uh, they'll all live in some sort of like, I don't know, polyamory thing. Well, is it really polyamory when it's like Nox and, a, and, and Malik and Nox have a thing and Nox and Amaris have a thing and Gadriel and Amaris have a thing. So it's like a, it's like, a, it's like this. <laughs> I don't, I, that, I guess, I don't know. I really wish it wasn't this stupid. I, I really do. Like, you know, for all the, I'm trying to get into it, but like for all the crap, at least the books could have been fucking good, you know? Like, at least there could have been stuff that, at least I wouldn't have had to like ask questions about every other fucking line, you know? Why did it have to be like this? Beta readers. What are y'all doing? What the fuck are y'all doing? Why aren't you asking pertinent questions? God damn, like what are y'all doing? Y'all, <laughs> Like, duh. what's more important to you as a beta reader? Like creating, helping create a work that a bunch of readers are not going to have a reading experience like I just had, or just being like a yes man? What What's more important to you? Cause like, it, it's not fun to feel like you have to be like, hey, I'm so sorry, but a lot of this doesn't make sense. Like we don't say that as, as beta readers who do give that kind of feedback, we don't say it to make anybody feel bad. We say it so that like, we can take the time to work at it. That way, when the audience finally gets their hands on it, it's an enjoyable work. As a reader, if I can just open a book and not have like a bunch of questions and wondering like, what the fuck? Why didn't any of these questions get answered? If I can just have a reading experience like that, as a picky reader, that's really fucking valuable to me. And I don't think just like, wow, thanks to the author for writing this. I think about all the people who, who went in and helped the author cultivate a book that, that lent itself to being like that. Like I, I don't, I don't actually want to open a book and have to take, like, do you know how many hours it takes? to make these videos. Do you know how many fucking hours? It's a lot of fucking labor and sometimes it burns me out. Filming the last thing burnt me out so bad. I had to film in two sections and then I had to take a two week break from filming after. I don't, I don't want to sit here and, and take 15 hours. <laughs> to create a video where I'm listing, like I have to make jokes just to keep myself going in doing this because it's not, it's not a great time like reading this on my own and thinking like, man, this doesn't make sense. Like I'm fucking reading it and I read before bed and I'm fucking falling asleep when I'm not highlighting stuff and saying that doesn't make any sense or I'm highlighting stuff where I'm not sure if it makes sense. So I have to highlight it and send it to my friends and be like, am I missing something? Does this make sense to you? And most of the time, nine times out of 10, the answer is no. I don't want it to 
be like that. Like, I want better books. I do. Better books take feedback. And I'm not saying you have to take mine, but take somebody's and not just like, this is great. It's so good. I had such a good time. Like, get those, but get other people too. Like, make make good books. Work at it. Take the time. Like, your book is worth it. Your your best story is worth taking the time to produce like that. It, it, it is. And that's why I'm so thankful to the authors who, like, go out of their way to do that shit, who, who take years to work at it and work at it and write draft after draft and they get alpha readers and beta readers and they get critique partners and they go to workshops and and, and they take classes like <laughs> I'm not saying you have to spend a bunch of money to make your book better I'm just saying like get more eyes on it take feedback value that feedback implement it write more drafts like give that story the attention that it deserves you deserve to have a readership that includes a lot of fucking people uh, and authors deserve that like authors authors deserve to write stories that that have that attention to detail so that they can find the most readership that they possibly can. That's just my opinion. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just rambling at this point. I, I'm, I've run out of notes. I'm just really frustrated because this book was so long. It was so long. And I, 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 I would find these little tidbits, these tiny little scenes, these like one paragraphs. And I would be like, if we could just do this the whole time, man, I'd be having such a fucking fun time. I don't know. It's frustrating. I get really fucking frustrated. I mean, those tidbits, there, there's more value in those tidbits that I really did love, like the ghoul scene and Tanith being kind of creepy at the beginning and Amar and, and Nox being interested in theology. If we could have just reworked, we would have had like such a great story. We could have had so much value in this. Like I would have had such a fucking fun time. And then I could have like shared it with my audience and my audience could have had a fucking fun time. I just, ah, this is so frustrating. Like there, there's more fun in those tidbits than, than there is in the entirety of Caraval. Like, uh, like prose wise, this really needs a lot of work, but like I don't have any fun reading Caraval. There is no bits and pieces of Caraval that I, uh, that I find like, man, if we could just expand upon this, I'd have such a fun time. There's nothing like that in Caraval. There is in this, but the problem is it gets drowned out by the writing being terrible, the plot being non-existent, the characters being ridiculous, the anachronisms out the wazoo. But damn, if we could just do the fun stuff, if we could have just worked on that. Damn, what a waste. <laughs> What a fucking waste. All right, I'm done. I'm really done this time. Sorry. Ugh. I have one more video to film tonight and then I'm going to bed. I'm gonna go read a good fantasy book to cleanse my palate. My camera keeps fucking cutting off and I'm just trying to end this video. Fuck. Okay, I'm done. Like and subscribe if you want. Comments down below. Questions. Okay. Hello, it's Trash Can Rachel and I have to say thank you for being a friend to my Therapy Bills patrons and those are Alexander, Ali Magpie, Amanda M, Ashley B, Bubble T, Cammy, Chris, Claire, Des Robert, DJ Raptopus. <laughs> Emperor's New Blues, Aaron, Eric, Faror, Jack and Jill, John E, Casey McKenzie, Kate, Caitlin, Kelly K, Quinn, Lady Kitty Bug, Lek, Molly, Alice, Peggy, Rain. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? <laughs> Reese, Samar, Scarlet, Shiny, SMK. Thank you all so much for being a friend. <laughs> and before I go, I have to say thank you for being a friend to my Potato Search Marks as patrons. And those are AM Angel, Alicia, Amanda B, Andy, Angelica, Anita, Artie the Ninth, Ashley H, Ava, BB, Beck, Blythe, Bookish Brain Rot, Ray, Bree, Brian, Caitlin, Harlan, Catherine, Kathy, Chris, CJ, Cole, Colleen, Corwin, Corey, Darren, Deborah, Diet Goth, Dorian, Dorotea, Ebby, Elise, Ember, Emily A, Emily L, Emma O A, Aaron, Aaron K, Hannah C, Hannah T, Harpy Kiro, Hello There Darling, Ilianaka, India Inc., JM Tenet, J is on Olympus, JP, Jen with two N's, Jennifer T, Jenny G, Jillian, Jules, Just Pugsley, <laughs> Kaylee, Kat, Katie, Katya, Kayala, Kendra, Kylie, Laughing Cat Dog, Laura, Lauren B, Library of Scars, Lisa B, Lou Siri, Luna Moth, Lustful Octopus, Martin, Marcella, Marquita, Maz, Malara, Meow Meow, James, Nat, Natalie M, Never, Nicole G, Nicole R, Nyan Binary, Page E, Page P, Penny Chilling, Fox Glove, Pixel Stars, Pure Atheon, Rachel B, Rat Sarah, Reba, Rebecca, Ren, Robin, Rosie, Rowan, Other Rowan, Sicoria, Zadie, Samantha, Sarah C, Sarah H, Sarah the Bear, Shamed, Shanae, Shannon, Shayna, Sheena K, Sean, Sierra, Stephanie, Talia, Three Old Dogs, Tiana, Tina, Toast, Trash Can, Teddy, Title Phoenix, Valentine, and Writer A. Thank you all so much for being a friend. <laughs>